<laughs> this is new for us. We're uh, kind of breaking off into recording in some unusual angles within the house and within the ministry. So bear with us as we get used to the new format. With the new year, January 1st, 2017, though for Jewish people, we've already started our new year. But for the rest of you, I understand that January 1st, 2017 is a new year. A lot of times people do see that as an opportunity to do things in a new way, to write resolutions, to consider and ponder the old things that have gone on in the last year and hopefully not bring them on to the new year. Obviously, we're going to be seeing some new changes, some presidencies that have changed, some people in the Congress that have either maintained and kept their job or changed their job or moved around. A lot of things go through the process of change, and one of the things that I'm kind of wondering in this year or in this day of decision is what would you do seriously if God came to you and said it's the end of the world oops what would you do I mean frankly for me it's a pretty simple decision you see I've been thinking about the end of the world since I got saved I didn't get saved and think, oh boy, God is going to give me an abundant life and I'm going to go out and have money, cars, excitement, joy, peace, love, you know, and change the world. We're going to evangelize the entire world and everybody's going to get saved. Not exactly how I got saved and not exactly what I thought about when I first got saved. Now I'll admit. Being a Jesus freak in the Jesus movement, when I first got saved, I had to kind of take a big look around because everywhere I went, no matter where it was in Orange County, everyone was saved. There was Melody Lamb, there was Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, there was uh, Campus Crusade for Christ, there was Jews for Jesus, there was Full Gospel Businessmen's Association. There was Trinity Broadcasting Network. There was CBN, Christian Broadcasting Network. There was um, PTL Club. There was, man, just about everything was happening and everything was going on that everywhere you looked, everyone was a Christian. Or so they said. Now, I didn't really know the difference among any of the Christian ways and means that people were expressing themselves a lot of them you know were building some fancy studios that look kind of like you know gold plated and everything but hey what can i say uh you know full gospel businessmen's association international was being built you know and i remember seeing that going up and then later calvary chapel took over the open fields you know and went from a tent to a building you know and that was kind of neat you know and i remember a lot of things changing before i actually left the glory days of Southern California when I thought everyone was saved. But you see, back then, we knew Jesus was coming, or at least everyone said so. One of the bylines of the Jesus movement was, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Hey, do you know Jesus is coming? Yeah, you better get saved now, man. Here, there, or in the air, twinkling of an eye, you know, you could be here, or you could be there, or you could be, you know, left behind, but you don't want to be left behind, so how about today? You know, choose you which day you, you choose you this day whom you will serve, whether it be the gods of men or whether it be the Lord your God, and ask Jesus into your life because you could be a born again Catholic, a born again Protestant, a born again Methodist. You could be born again anything. You know, you just need to be born again. So, hey, how about right now? Ask Jesus into your heart and soul, mind, strength, giving your life. You know, because after all, what is life except for that you get to know God? You know, and to be with Him eternally. So, really, now that it's been oh. 40 years later, 
What would you do if God came to you today? Now, in your hearing, and he spoke to you direct, and he said to you, it's the end of the world. Would you look at your clock? Would you maybe stop for a minute and ask him, well, how long do I got? Tick tock, tick tock. Mm -hmm. Would you maybe get into a conversation with him? You know, I think about when God told me, <laughs> boy, boy, <laughs> when God spoke to me, <laughs> all I could say is, Anybody that remembers those E.F. Hutton commercials, it would be, when E.F. Hutton speaks, everybody listens. In other words, they would go to this freeze, you know, and you would suddenly see that everybody was listening to whatever E.F. Hutton was saying. Well, I'd like to tell you that God is like that, but it's not true. You see, when God speaks, people go, uh... Let me do it with this hand. See if you can see it in the picture. Yeah, okay, you can see it. Uh-uh. Yet. No. Ninguno. Huh? Can't hear you. What was that you said? Say that again. In other words, God hasn't stopped speaking. God has been saying the same thing for over 40 years. But, you know, I'm just kind of talking to you and I, you know, today while it's still called today, about what would you do, not who do, but what would you do if God came to you and you no questions asked, you know, no shadow of a doubt, no no wondering whether or not it was, you know, hearing voices and going crazy, but what would you do if God said to you, it's the end of the world? Now I'm recording this and it's pretty dark. Kind of cloudy outside. Kind of cold. Kind of a little windy, a little rainy, you know, and it's... I'll admit I'm recording this before January 1st. I have no clue what the weather's gonna be like then. Some of these things we've had to do ahead of schedule. We've had to plan them out, you know, get them ready because, you know, after all, God told me 40 years ago. But looking outside at the fallen leaves that have fallen off of the trees and the barrenness of the land and just the overwhelming kind of gloominess, it's easy to think it's the end of the world. Matter of fact, some people told me back in, you know, uh, eight years ago when um, President Obama got elected, it was the end of the world. <laughs> Now, they're looking at Donald Trump and going, oh, it is the end of the world. <laughs> well, <laughs> what are you going to do, man? I mean, you had, you know, first you got one, then you got the other, and, you know, you're going to keep saying every president is the end of the world? I mean, what's up with that? Is your vision or version of the end of the world based upon what you want to see or what you think ought to be? So really, what are you going to do if God would come to you and say, it's the end of the world? You see, like I said, I've been doing this for a little while now, you know. Way back when, I understand, you know, people used to say, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. And they would get all excited, you know, and it's like parable of ten virgins. You've got to be ready, get your oil, you know. So we all kind of cleaned up our act. You know, put on our best dress, Sunday blues, you know, shaved off our beards, you know, because believe me, everybody had a long beard. Long hair, you know, pretty much a lot of us cut it off, you know. Cleaned up our act, walked with God, told Him where it was at, you know, and took off and did the things that we said we would do when we got saved. Oh, we'll, we'll never deny you, Lord. We'll go out and we'll witness and we'll do this, that, and the other thing, you know. And I remember leaving Southern California. Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, and going out, boom, falling flat on my face, you know, what can I say? But, you know, when I went out and I 
you know, discovered my walk of faith, my life as a Christian, having Jesus with me even in my sins. Yes, Jesus is there in your sin, you know, just like he's there when you poop or when you sleep or when you, you know, fornicate or whatever you're doing. You know, I mean, God knows I don't want to, eh, you know, see it. But, hey, if God is in you, guess what? <laughs> whatever you've been doing, I hope it's been to the glory of God and not to, you know, the shame of crucifying Jesus' name again. You know, kind of, ugh. But, hey, you know, it's real life. And I've done it. I've blown it. I've lost it. You know, kind of, you know, spread my cookies all over the place, you know, and kind of had to, you know, like clean up the mess that I've been through. And I reaped what I sowed. Oh, yeah. Big time. But being that we live by grace and that God has forgiven us because of what His Son has done, I know that I know that I know when God spoke to me about Jesus is coming, I knew he was coming. I just knew it. Then when I studied it, I began to learn more and more. Only for me, it didn't become an obsession, you know, where I had to know exactly the day or the hour. Although I do, I'm pretty sure I know the week, you know, and I'm pretty sure I'm confident of the hour, more or less, you know, kind of, you know, cry went out at midnight, so kind of like, Somewhere between midnight and dawn, I think you got a pretty good window of opportunity going on there. Hey, the cry went out, the Lord's coming. Do you, know, you remember reading that? You know, and that sometime during that week of seven days, you know, it's like, well, you know, the bridegroom, the bridesmaids, you know, they kind of went out to see him, you know, and cry went out and they were out there. Well, were they out there one day or six days or seven days? I know pretty much between one and seven days and pretty much night somewhere. Could be in Jerusalem, so in America, it'd be daytime. Ooh, think about that one. <laughs> Oops. Depends on where the wedding is. <laughs> well, bluntly, I studied these things, you know, and I studied them pretty intensely once I got out from Calvary Chapel. And I was out on um, pretty much Oregon, I think I moved to first, and that was kind of like a, a wasteland of satanic <laughs> rituals and people that were into animal, you know, I don't know, whatever you want to call it you know they were sleeping with animals and doing all kinds of things and they had witches covens and you know i mean it was just like some place that oh man what a place to send someone like me you know and but i was learning from the lord you know and he was teaching me things and so i got a chance to open up a calvary chapel well calvary chapel. i got to open up a firefighters for christ typically in a lending library and listen to the tapes over again as i was lending them out and to also be a part of you know different churches that were there before any Calvary Chapel came there, before any vineyard came there, before there was anybody there that would normally be called quote unquote biblically accurate, you know, I went to church there and there were some pretty good churches, you know, some Assemblies of God, it was a pretty good church and the one that I went to was called People's Community Church, it was a pretty good church you know, but they really didn't understand much about the coming of the Lord, they didn't know anything about the end of the world and they really didn't do much about the book of Revelation but I did. <laughs> so when I studied, I kind of got down to, okay, Jesus is coming sooner than you think. And the way I used to say that was that the reason why I said sooner than you think is because, because when it came to death, Christians didn't want to talk about dying. Now me, I was all for, hey, you know what? I got Crohn's disease. It's killing me. I'm not supposed to live past 30, so I'm all into dying. What are we going to do when I get there? What do you mean, what are you going to do when you get there? Dying is like miserable, you know, canker sores and, you know, worms eating your eyeballs out, you know, and like rotting in the flesh and the, in the, the dirt, you know, and I, no, I'm not going to be there. I'm out there. I'm going out. I, I'm, trust me, as soon as like body dead, Michael's gone. <laughs> to be absent from the body was Michael was making a vacation, you know, and he's, heading for heaven as fast as he could go so he wouldn't wind up in hell. The one who missed that bus or train or whatever it is, you know, coming by and taking me away. But knowing that you could die, I studied those things and told people, look, hey, Jesus is coming, but he may be coming for you sooner than you think. Because the parable of the wealthy man was told in such a way that Jesus said, look, you know, there's a man who went out and he worked and he sweated and he, he did all these things, you know, in order to have a wonderful retirement. 
And he says, now that I've got my wealth, now that I've got my health, now that I've built me barns and, you know, I've accumulated all these wealthy and earthly goods, what should I do? And he sat down and reasoned with himself, I know what I should do. I should build bigger barns. I should make and enjoy the increase of my goods. And Jesus looked at him and said, you fool, tonight you shall be required of you your soul. The man had never prepared for eternity. He died, and all of his goods were dispersed among those that were living. So a lot of times I use the expression, in the land of the living, when I'm praying. I'm saying, Lord, as long as I'm in the land of the living, you know, as long as I'm down here, you know, then please do this. But don't wait until I get there to do it, you know. Help me now, Lord, in my time and now. Because I know that God operates in a different kind of venue. You know, he's like in heaven, and I'm here on earth, you know, and kind of got to keep that in perspective. But since I already knew, and I had already told people for about the last 10, 15 years, no, the rapture will not be in 2010, 2000, 1980, or whatever it was. Every year I kept telling people, no. Jesus is not coming this year. And just like I can tell you right now, I'm recording this in 2016. No, Jesus is not coming in 2016. But January 1st, 2017, oh yeah! Um, I think you better look up. Jesus is coming sooner than you think. He's right around the corner. He's even knocking at the door. Now, each one of those expressions that I say, like Jesus coming sooner than you think, meant about, hey, you could die, you know, and then right around the corner was like, um, God's trying to get your attention, meaning that, you know, spiritually, the Holy Spirit is pulling back. He's the waning of the Holy Spirit's influence in the world. You could see that kind of obviously by, you know, kind of look at the political scenery. You don't like it, keep watching. You know, you're going to get prosperity, but you're going to get, guess what? <laughs> evil, you know, but okay, you know, if you can deal with it, great, go ahead. Um, I have other things that I think God wants me to do first. So, seeing all of these things, you know, I used to have these expressions that I would add each year until finally we got to, and I knew that 2017 was the beginning of time of the, you could say, the countdown, you want to call it countdown to midnight or whatever. Um, basically, a countdown of 2017 through 2022 where the probability studies, meaning that me and a lot of other fanatical, really in-depth kinds of, you know, intellectual, um, kind of almost genius level type of examination of scriptures, um, we went into studies, you know, and we used to all compare notes, you know, when we were like back in the bulletin board days, when it was like before the internet. And most of us had concluded, hey, you know what, there can be no rapture before the Mayan calendar ends. Then after the Mayan calendar ends, there'll probably be kind of a lull where people will either be, you know, like convinced or not convinced or whatever they're doing. And then, you know, the Lord could return. And so there was always that kind of like event, you know, non-event. And then eventually once God had set aside everybody's idea, poof, when people were saying peace and safety, oh, sudden destruction comes. Well, it's kind of the same way with the rapture. It's not about what you see being wrong getting worse and worse and worse but there being a lull in it kind of think about that so i used to keep my eyes on the clouds you know kind of going whoa well it's clear tonight i'm not worried and my wife knows i talk like that and she expects you know we even tease each other sort of my sister used to worry you know call up the rapture hotline you know rapture hotline we're still here so so are you <laughs> you know i mean what can i say that's my sister but, you know, I should, well, I won't say which one, so I'll just leave it at that. But um, my wife, you know, we when we can't find each other in the house, hey, you know, we start, my first thought is, well, she got raptured. You know, like, you know, I got left behind. But the blunt truth of 2017 through 2022 is it's 80% chance. So many people studied this that, no, we weren't caught up in any of the stupidity of people coming around and saying, oh, the Lord's going to come back in whatever year they pick, you know. Just recently, we got done with the camping thing, you know. I mean, that was one of the biggest, you know, money-making, wealthy men enterprises where somebody was actually, his intent was good. His content was wrong, but his intent was good. He was just off. And then, Hagee and and uh, some of the messianic, hang in there. That's right. That's why uh, Scooby-Doo's here. 
because he's hanging in there until Jesus comes again. So he's trying to hang on until he gets raptured too. Scooby-Doo, where are you? He got raptured, we got left behind. Would that bother you? So you see, what I recognized was that people didn't know, even people like Bliven and Camping, and recently we've had some Jewish guy come out of Messianic messed up stuff, you know, and he's been the darling of, you know, uh, Pentecostals and Evangelicals, and I don't know why, you know, I mean, they come up with these... Um, Harbingers and Khan, you know, and he, I mean, if I had a name like Khan, I'd change it before I even got involved in the ministry. But, you know, Jonathan Khan's a false prophet, false teacher. He's been telling all kinds of stories about American prophecy. Oh, give me a break. You know, come on, go away. But if, if, if America's in prophecy, I'll eat my Bible. You know, that's why I keep telling people. I told him that back 40 years ago. I'll still keep saying it until I die. Because Jesus did not put America in prophecy. We're too young. We're too much of a baby nation. I mean, we'll probably self-destruct before we even get out of our diaper stage. But that being said, the wise men all pretty much had this 2017 through 2022, and now this 2034 kind of extension, you know, kind of like, well, you know, if you added some of the tribulation period in, the latest date could be a 2034. Sir Isaac Newton, I think, predicted 2056, I think, I'm not sure, but it's interesting. For me, God told me to get ready in 2017 and to make it like ongoing, warning, 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 warning. I can't think of Lost in Space, the little kid, but anyways, the robot used to tell him, warning, warning, and that's what I'm doing. I'm giving you a warning, but my warning is pretty factual. It's pretty accurate. But... I'm not here right now in this particular video to warn you or to argue with you or even to debate it because I don't really care. Um, you, you know, go to heaven or go to hell, get right or get left. You know, I mean, you're going to be here or you're going to go with Jesus and meet him in the air. But if you don't prepare, you won't be there. That's the problem is that you do have to do something. It's not an auto, you know, I got saved, automatically raptured kind of routine. That's not what it says in the book of Revelation. So I guess now we're getting to the brass tacks of why we're talking to each other what if today january 1st 1999 no i remember there used to be a cartoon sunday or uh, uh, british made star wars kind of program on tv called 1999 well <laughs> we passed it <laughs> but it was kind of like it was neat you know it had a lot of you know kind of special effects that probably look hokey now but puppeteering or something But if God said to you, it's the end of the world, or better yet, if he just said, the end of the world, what's your response? When, Lord? See, I ask questions. I'm not content with this standard idea of just like, oh, well, we're going to figure it out on our own. I'm not following man. See, I, I tend to have this attitude... It's a bad attitude about men, but frankly, I've seen what men and women can do when they are allowed to mess with words and ideas and theology and come up with these weird thoughts and expressions like, you know, the immutable word of God or whatever it may be, or immutable Bible or, you know, whatever. And I just look at it and go, no, you know, the Spirit of God can make the Word of God, or make the Bible become the Word of God. Then if the Spirit of God is interpreting it, and the Spirit of God is revealing it, and the Spirit of God is causing you to hear it, then it's by the Spirit of God, because the Spirit of God is perfect, that it becomes the perfect Word. It's just not perfect in its state of being written there. That's not perfect. And, but by the Spirit of God, it becomes perfect. So, you know, kind of, don't let people get you kind of sidetracked on that. But ending this is right where it is at the beginning. What would you do? All lies aside, all, you know, playing games, put aside all of your stories and, you know, making up your religious ideas set aside. What would you do if God spoke out loud and said, the end of the world is coming? 
think about it. It happened already. It happened to no one. The end of all pleasure is at hand. What's up with that? You know, I got a feeling Noah had some conversation. So, I got to ask you because, you know, it's happening. It's coming. Very soon. Jesus is coming sooner than you think. He's right around the door. He's right around the corner. He's even knocking at your door. And if he's knocking at your door, why is he outside and not inside? But my question to you, how come you don't know that it's the end of the world? And then my other question is, even worse, is are you living like it's the end of the world? Or are you, you know, just in case it's not the end of the world, we have our retirement account, we have our education fund, we have our investment for our children. I mean, after all, God's going to give us kudos for investing for our children's future when so many people are starving next door to us. You know, we could have used that money for somewhere else or something else or somehow. Couldn't we? Or should we make it better for our children than what we have? Any man who has loved his children more than he loves me is not worthy to be my disciple? I think I heard that somewhere. God understands your love for your family. God understands your love for your husband, your wife, your children, or whatever it may be. But until you answer that question, you don't know whether you love Jesus more or less than you love your family. Because the bottom line is, what would you do if Jesus came to you and said, the end of the world is coming? What if the Spirit of God breathed into you, confirmed it to you? What are you going to do about that? Are you just going to go on with church as usual? Is it just, you know, you think you've been doing okay and everything's like fine, we're just going to keep cruising? We've been doing what we, you know, God told us to, so it's okay. Jesus is coming, that's okay. I don't need to say anything to anybody. I don't want to be a kook, a crackpot. I don't want to be laughed out of church, you know, because I got the wrong date. But Jesus made a statement that was interesting. He said, the Son of Man will appear for those who are looking for his coming. But he also made another statement that I find very sober that I want you to think about. Because our question to you at the beginning of this was, and we'll end it with that, is that what would you do if God came to you and said, the end of the world has come? Because it has. You don't have any time left. The end of the, you could quote me, the end of the world has come. 2017 through 2022, you better be looking and better be prepared because you got no time for your kids to grow up. You better do what you need to do and get it done and over with. You prepare it. Because you're not going to get oil and go back to the store and buy some more. You either do it now or you won't be ready when he shows up. So, really, the hard part of what Jesus says is coming throughout all these videos in a lot of ways. Sobering thoughts and things that should make you think. But the one that kind of gets to me is Jesus looked at his disciples and he said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? He didn't mean faith to move mountains. He didn't mean faith the size of a mustard seed or anything like that. He said, will he find faith? And I'm sure he said it sorrowfully. In all humility, I've taken a lot of grief and flack over the years for telling people that Jesus is not coming when they said it was. And they called me a false prophet, a false teacher, a false whatever. And yet, for 40 years, I've been right. Noah, for 400 years, preached, warning them the flood is coming while he built the boat. I've been getting ready for 2017 for 40 years. And 2017 has arrived, and now I'm telling you, Jesus is coming sooner than you think. He's right around the corner. He's knocking at your door. What will you do when God confirms to you the end of the world is coming? It's up to you. It's 
up to you to take it seriously and then do as God has said to do. Otherwise, Jesus is coming to you to ask, have I found faith? Or were you just busy about your religious expressions and doing the things you thought you should do rather than what God has said to you? Today, as we're told when you hear his voice, harden not your heart. What would you do if Jesus came to you and said the end of the world has come?